So in this lecture, we're going to talk about variability and why it's the bad guy. So variability is the villain, especially when you're an operations manager or a supply chain manager. And so this is a lecture that I created because, you know, as an industrial and systems engineer, I always knew to hate variability. I knew naturally people would say variability is bad, but I always didn't have the intuition of why. Like, why is it bad? What's going on? And so this lecture um, is meant for you to think like an IE, think like an industrial and systems engineer, and specifically incorporate variability into your decision making process. So this lecture um, combines um, some things from the textbook, some supplemental, um, and just to get you kind of some building some intuition about the impact of variability to operational decisions. Um, and so let's just get started. So to get started, what is variability? So just as kind of a formal definition, variability is anything that causes the system to depart or vary from regular predictable behavior. Um, so variability is something that exists in all systems. The world is variable. Humans are variable. Um, things don't exactly happen in regular increments. Things that we expect to happen don't exactly happen, right? So there's variability all around us. And why do we care is because variability impacts performance. Um, one way to think about how it impacts performance is if you ever have to think about a commute, um, and you have to go somewhere to a really important event. If there's variability, you'll go way, way early to make sure you make it to the event on time. If it's really regular, then you don't have to go so early ahead of time, right? And that's because variability impacts performance. We'll see that over and over again um, in this lecture. Therefore, we have to be able to measure it. We need to understand it. And then ultimately, we need to make decisions that incorporates um, variability. So we'll do all three of those things in this lecture. We'll measure variability. We'll try to build up some intuition and try to understand um, a little bit more about what's going on um, when we have variability and ultimately make decisions that incorporates the fact that the world is going to be variable. That doesn't mean we can't do anything. There's lots of options we can pursue. So in terms of this class in supply chains, you know, what are some sources of variability in supply chains? Um, in the very first lecture, I said, you know, what makes designing and managing um, supply chains hard or difficult is the fact that there's variability. If we knew exactly what was happening, it would be tedious and maybe complex, but we could do it. What makes it really hard is variability. So where does variability show up? Well, it really shows up everywhere. You can think about, from when a customer would arrive. So how are people placing demand? It would be awesome if they always place demand exactly you know, in increments, like every day they place the same amount. That doesn't happen. If you operate a retail store, you know, your arrivals are not regular, right? There's variability in that. Um, there also, if you could say, well, okay, I'm just gonna make people schedule their arrivals. Well, then, you know, you could have no shows, last minute changes to scheduling, right? So you, even if you plan, you might reduce some of the variability, um, but you still have it. That's on the demand side. On the supply side, you know, what if your employee doesn't show up? What if your machine is down? Those are variabilities on supply or resources. Um, and variability shows up on the resource side, both in things we can control for example, when you have to set up a machine, so if you're in manufacturing, you have to set up a batch, that adds variability to the process. Also preventative maintenance, that adds variability to the process. Um, but there's also variability in things we don't control. When a machine goes down, when we have material shortages, those cause variability as well. We also get variability in quality. Why? You could think about it, if I have a quality problem, I have to redo, have rework, it, you expected it to take this amount of time. If you have quality problems, you're, it's taking twice as long as you expected, right? So that, that causes variability. Um, some of the variability in the world makes what the world fun to live in. You know, So humans are variable. If we weren't, we'd all be robots. That would be boring, right? So you know, request variety, technological change, employees having different skill levels, even task request variability, those are things that are not necessarily bad. In fact, they make what living in the world exciting and interesting, but they do cause problems operationally and should be understood. Um, so those are all examples of variability. 
Another one is you could be perfect. Your system is perfect. It has no variability and variability can still cause you all kinds of problems. Why? Because of what's called flow variability. If I'm doing everything perfectly, but whatever's flowing into me has variability, then I, my system is going to have variability. And so as a industrial and systems engineer, this is something to really take into account. And this is the impact of making sure you're not sub-optimizing things. You know, you can make your little world perfect without any variability and you can still be impacted um, systematically if things are coming in um, to your world. So variability is the villain, right? So he is a bad guy that causes problems. Okay, so why uh, is variability the villain? It causes operating problems. And we'll see this throughout the lecture in a number of different ways. Um, and so we need to manage it and we need to account for it in the decision-making process. One thing to realize with variability is um, you should try to reduce as much variability as possible in your system. That's why Six Sigma, if you've ever heard of Six Sigma, is all about reducing variability in systems. Um, and so you really should try to reduce um, as much variability as you can, um, but you likely won't get rid of it all, okay? But you should still try to do that and design systems. And there are things you can make decisions about that will naturally reduce variability. We will study some of those in this class. One example of that is pooling resources. If you pool your resources, that's a way to reduce variability. We'll learn some other kind of cool tricks to reduce variability. So you should do that, okay? But then at the end of the day, there is going to be variability in your systems. And I think it's really critical to design systems that mitigate the impact of variability. And so that may be doing different things to just acknowledge that you'll have variability. One of those is to design your systems that have buffers. So if you know there's gonna be variability, you may have extra inventory, you may have extra capacity, you may you know, do other things like that. And so just acknowledging and measuring and capturing it um, is step one. And then, you know, of course we could improve the system if we could reduce the variability, but even if you um, don't do that, I think it's really important to incorporate it into your decision-making process. So how do we incorporate variability into our decision-making process? We need some sort of language to do that. And so the language typically that industrial and systems engineers, supply chain managers use is probability theory. So we typically use what is the probability something will happen to describe uncertainty or variability. So if you look at this kind of very simple uh, schematic, impossible and certain, those have no variability, right? You're 0% or 100%, you know that with certainty, right? Everything else in between um, has some level of variability. Some have more or less, right? Um, and so we'll use probability um, mathematically to help us study systems. And mathematically, it gives us a way to measure things. Um, but I think it's also good to have some intuition. And the thing I will say about probability is probability is one of these things that seems seemingly simple and is extremely complex. Um, we as humans, I think, are really bad at having any intuition about probability. So here's my first uh, question to see how well your intuition is about probability. So my question to you is which is more likely, a natural disaster in California that kills a thousand people or an earthquake in California that kills a thousand people? So hopefully you, you said A, uh, a natural disaster in California that kills a thousand people um, is more likely because an earthquake is a subset of all the possible natural disasters that could happen. And so um, if an earthquake is just one of many different examples of a natural disaster, then A is more likely. If you didn't get that right, don't feel bad. Um, actually, these two uh, people did this study um, and actually won you know, Nobel Prizes for this and asked similar like questions actually at a conference where people knew statistics really well and a ton of people got this wrong. And that is because intuition for us is we're not usually really great at it and we're not usually very rational uh, human decision makers. So the context matters and you know, as our human brain, we think in narratives and stories and the context influences our intuition. 
And so the correct answer here is A, but if you didn't get that uh, right, don't feel bad. Um, you're in good company. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons I want to have this lecture is, first of all, to acknowledge we are pretty bad at this as human beings. And I think that's fine. I think it's important to just acknowledge that we have pretty bad probabilistic intuition. And so that's why we really need to emphasize it and study it and think about it and hopefully kind of play with it um, so that this becomes and you build the intuition muscle in your head. So, you know, we are actually as humans pretty good at uh, mean performance or sometimes what's called first moment effects. So on average, if something happens, we're pretty good at understanding the influence of that. So for example, um, if we make something faster, we just speed it up, on average, we should produce more widgets per hour. Our throughput increases. That should make sense. Like intuitively, that should make sense. If I have some sort of thing uh, and it's available uh, more of the time, then I should also be able to produce more things on average. Again, hopefully that intuition makes sense. Um, the number of people waiting increases with arrival rate. So as more people on average show up, we're going to have more people on average waiting. That also hopefully makes sense. So uh, you know, these are just examples that say our intuition is probably good for first moments, for average or mean performance. Our intuition is not so good for variance. Um, these are sometimes called second moment effects, which we'll see on the next slide. The mathematical equation has a second moment in it, hence the name. Um, so it's not quite as obvious what is the answer uh, to the following two questions. Uh, which is more variable, serving times of individuals or a group of individuals? Which are more disruptive, long infrequent failures or short frequent ones? I'll let you kind of ponder those. Um, it might not totally be obvious. What is the answer to those questions? We'll explore them and some of them you'll explore also um, in your homework. So one of your homework problems asks you to create a Monte Carlo simulation which actually asks, it's in a machine setting, but kind of the first question. So if I have an individual machine or I have a group of machines, which one um, is more variable and how does it influence performance? Um, the second question we'll, we'll tackle in a follow-on video um, in this lecture series. So the fact that you're not quite sure means we're just not that great as human beings at understanding that having intuition. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything, right? Uh, math to the rescue, right? So mathematically, we can quantify variability and quantify performance and then use that to um, design systems, understand systems, and incorporate variability into our decision-making process. So just as a reminder, these are hopefully reviews, but the mean performance or expected value. Um, so if you have a finite um, set of outcomes, you have a discrete um, distribution, how do you determine what you should expect or your average performance? That's just your outcome times the probability of that outcome, plus your next outcome times the probability of that outcome, all the way over all sets of outcomes. So mathematically um, shown in, in the first equation. If you have infinitely many outcomes or you have a continuous uh, random variable, then you would take the integral um, over that you know, set. And so that gives you the expected or mean performance. Those are sometimes, again, known as first moment effects because they're linear, your um, linear combinations if you look at the finite case. On the other hand, variance is a second moment effect. And that's because what is variance mathematically? It just seems very simple mathematically. It's just here is an outcome minus what the mean or the expected thing is squared. So that's where the second moment comes from. Um, and so you would... Uh, do that, you know, over kind of all of your different cases. And that gives you um, the second moment or your variance. All right, so now we know kind of mathematically, let's build some intuition. So my first uh, question to you is true or false? Variability and process times can lead to customer waiting, even when the average utilization of the resource is less than one. So here I say, okay, my utilization of my resource is, let's say, 80% on average. So will I have to wait? So the correct answer here is true. Um, you can wait in a system, and likely you will have all waited in the system, even if the average uh, utilization of the resource that you're waiting for 
is less than one. So the correct answer is true. And we'll see this in our next example. So let's start with an example um, that shows the process time that has no variability. And so in this example um, with no variability, you can see here we have exact, every service time here is exactly four minutes. And the variance is zero because it's exactly four minutes. So there are four, it would be zero. Um, here's what happens minus what I expected there. And then square that it would always be zero. Um, and so here you have service time always four um, so on average is four, variance of zero. Um, and the other thing we put in here is, you know, we actually schedule people every five minutes. So even though the service time takes four minutes, um, I'm gonna give them a slot every five minutes. So if you think about your utilization of your resource here, you have four minutes of like use, but I gave you five minutes of time. So you're 80% utilized on average, and here in this example that has no variability, guess what you also don't have? No waiting time. So if you have no variability and your utilization of your resource is less than one, you don't have any waiting time. However, this is not a very common situation. The reality is typically that you have a much more variable process. So what does this mean? You can see that sometimes people show up when they're supposed to, patient one showed up on time, uh, however, not everyone does that, right? So some people are late <laughs> for their service. The other thing, so there's where variability comes in. People don't show up when they're supposed to. Another place where variability shows up is um, here is the service times. Um, and you can see the first one took five minutes, second one six, seven, and so forth, but some take two. And if you just kind of plot this um, as like a histogram, three of them took two minutes, two of them took three, et cetera you have variability in service times as well, okay? So this is a more common situation. You have variability in arrival times, you also have variability in service times. So my next kind of uh, conceptual question for you is if this is a representative sample of patient service times, how long do you expect the next patient service to take? So in other words, what's the expected value um, of service times? And just as a reminder, I put up the equation there um, for you. And uh, so calculate what is the expected value um, for this data set. You may need to pause. I know it takes a little more time, so please pause the video if you need to. So how would you do this? Well, um, basically to apply this equation, we would say, okay, the outcome, my xi, so x1, you could say, is two. And then what's the probability of that? Well, that's uh, three divided by 12, right? So three divided by 12 is the probability. My outcome is two. And then plus here, you'd have three times um, two divided by 12, four times two divided by 12 and so forth. If you do that math, you should get 4.083 minutes. So on average, it's almost four minutes. So on average, we have a service time that's four minutes, but our variability, our variance is no longer zero. Our variance is a positive number. So just to kind of reinforce that, my first system that had no waiting in it and this next system, both have average resource utilizations that are the same. So you could think about the times being served on average, they all took four minutes and we gave them a time slot of five minutes. So on average, we have 80% um, utilization of our resource. However, they don't have the same system performance. So going back to my first true and false question, do, is there waiting in the system? We have on average 80% utilization and the answer is yes, there is a bunch of uh, waiting in the system. If you plot, um, you know, when someone arrives and the service, you know, so the first person, great, you know, they didn't have to wait, hence why you should always uh, schedule the first appointment in the morning, because other people don't mess up your schedule. You just have to be on time and the doctor also should be on time. So you see the first person doesn't have to wait. The second person, look, they show up late, and that's actually a huge problem for the system. This person didn't have to wait, but the system, what happened here is you have some idle time. I would love to be working on something, but I don't have anything because no one is here. 
that is the problem that causes um, us to need to make sure we're releasing work at strictly less than our um, capacity is because what happens in this little time here is that you'll never get that time back. <laughs> that is gone forever. And that causes major problems um, in systems. So you can see the second person also doesn't have to wait, but guess what? The third person, they were nice. They came early. They still have to wait this red mine. Why? Because the second person both showed up late and took too long, longer than average, right? And so that then starts this chain event of this person who, you know, was showing up early, but, you know, wasn't used. And so then they end late, which means this person ends late and you'd see it takes a long time, even though inside of here, if you look at like the sixth person, they have less smaller than average um, service times, they still get penalized because what happens is a queue or a line formed. Um, and there's this kind of compounding effect of a problem over time. And so finally, by the end of the day, because there's some short stuff, you know, they get back to, okay, what there's no waiting time, but it's, it's you know, still, um, a problem. Okay. So going back to our true and false, um, this is an example on average, we're only utilizing our resource 80% of the time. We have four minutes for service. We give them a five minute slot, but because of variability, there's all kinds of waiting time. And so, you know, one thing to note is that's bad. It could be even worse, uh, if we made the variability even more. And so the other kind of takeaway is as variability in service time increasing, our waiting times increase even more. So um, if we had even more variability, like some were really short and but some were really long, what happens here is as the variability, which are the different colored lines, we get even more and more um, uh, waiting times. Um, in our system. And so um, the expected waiting time in the queue increases with variability. Um, and also we'll learn um, in the next couple slides and some activities about the relationship between utilization and waiting time. But as an example that I just gave on the previous one, we have an average 80% utilization, right? So for this red line, which has low variability, you know, I have some waiting, but it's low. But if I go to more variability, for the same service um, resources, so I have the same kind of scheduling and schedule the same number of people per day. What happens as variability goes up, I just get crappy and crappier service, right? And so um, you can say kind of for a fixed resource utilization, my service gets worse. Or you could say, okay, I want some given uh, resource uh, or some given service level, how should I set my, my resources? Um, and that's my next question um, to you. So for this example, if you want the average number in the system to be two or less, what utilization level do you recommend for your resources? To give you some orientation for this graphic, on the x-axis is the utilization of my resource. And on the y-axis is the average number in the system. And this orange line here is two. So if I want the average, my y-axis to be um, less than or equal to two, what utilization level do you recommend for your resource? So the correct answer here is C, 85%. If you pick 95%, you would have on average, you know, five people waiting in your system. If you pick 90%, you have on average, I don't know, two almost three. So here at this point here would be the best, right? And so it's somewhere in between 85% and 90%. But if I pick 90%, you have good resource utilization, but bad service. You're doing worse than you wanted your target, right? Okay, so 85% gets you underneath this orange line. That's good. But then you could say, well, why not 80%? Well, from a resource efficiency perspective, at 80%, you're going to have to either hire more people or hire um, more systems, robots, whatever. So you want as high of resource utilization that gives you the service level you want. Um, so C, 85% is the correct answer. My next kind of intuition question is, if nothing else changes, so I still have um, 
you know, nothing else changes except I now have the variability in arrival rates has increased. So the people show up even less regularly than I thought. What needs to happen to your resource utilization level to continue to have the average number in the system to be two or less? So I still went two or less on average. The only thing I changed was I increased the variability um, in my system, specifically arrivals. What would have to happen? So the correct answer here is A, it will need to decrease below 85%. And this is again why variability is the villain. I didn't do anything other than increase the variability and now I can't use my resources as efficiently as I want to. That's why variability is the villain. It's the bad guy in my comic book. Um, so the correct answer is A, um, it will need to decrease below 85%. And that's really the curse of variability. As variability increases, then the amount of buffers must increase as well. So the example I just gave is we were using time as a buffer. We made our people wait. That means as the variability goes up, our time um, waiting goes up, how many people are waiting goes up. We could use a different buffer. We could say, nope, uh, we're not gonna make people wait. Instead, we're gonna have more idle resources. But if you have higher variability for that same level of, we don't ever want anyone to wait, we're just gonna have higher um, capacity, extra capacity is gonna need. So um, variability increases these things that are expensive, right? Waiting is expensive because it's bad service. Extra capacity is expensive because that's usually human or equipment resources that you're investing in. So that's not good. Um, alternative, you could say, okay, I'm gonna reduce variability. And then what that does is we get the positive. It reduces the amount of buffers needed. We can have less waiting time for the same um, resource utilization, um, for example. And so the big takeaway is that systems with high variability should operate at lower levels of resource utilization than systems with lower variability. Um, and so this in purple is really why the whole concept of Six Sigma exists. If you can reduce variability, you can reduce how many resources you need for the same service level. And that is really impactful. That matters in terms of performance um, and is a huge thing. So reducing variability should be something um, you try to do. And so to provide better quality service, if you can reduce variability, that will reduce waiting times for the same resource level, which is awesome. So that's the end of this lecture, but we're gonna do some more kind of intuition building on follow on.